So I'm going to talk to you, we're gonna change gears, really big change of gears, and talk to you about type one diabetes, which was, is, is entirely unrelated. The, the pathophysiology of type one diabetes is completely unrelated to type two diabetes in terms of the etiology, how, how does it happen? But the reason they're called the same condition is because the symptoms are the same, high blood sugar, um, and the complications can be quite similar, especially the microvascular complications, the eyes, the kidneys, and the nerves. Most of that comes from prolonged exposure to high blood sugar. So that is why the two diabetes share um, the same nomenclature, both because of the symptoms of, um, of un undiagnosed diabetes, which is having to go to the bathroom a lot, um, thirsty all the time, hungry all the time, some weight loss, um, lethargy, those, those are both shared with both kinds of diabetes. And type two diabetes has a little bit more of a prolonged onset. Dr. Masharani was explaining um, why they changed the guidelines and, and made it more aggressive to diagnose diabetes. It used to be a lot higher number, but people with type two diabetes were actually brewing complications and not getting diagnosed. So that's why we, the guidelines have gotten more aggressive and we're lowering the, the level of blood sugar in order to be diagnosed. Whereas type one diabetes is much more acute in onset. And that's because type one diabetes is, is a, an, a, an insulin deficiency, not an insulin resistance. And the pancreas, the beta cells, as Dr. Mascherani says, or I say beta cells, because I'm not British. Um, the beta cells are, are insulin producing cells in the pancreas. And in type one diabetes, the body attacks through an autoimmune process, those beta cells and destroys them. And so a person with type one diabetes becomes insulin deficient very, very quickly. Um, the symptoms can be as short of, as one month. Uh, their autoimmune process has probably been happening for many years, but the symptoms can be as short as one month and they can become very ill very quickly. Because once you stop making insulin, the body gets sick very quickly. With type two diabetes, it's a much more insidious process. It takes years, um, and often the symptoms aren't super acute. They don't come on rapidly. And so it's harder to sort of find it. Um, and it's not a problem of insulin deficiency. It's often a problem of insulin resistance. And like he explained in the first two slides, you have a, a problem with the beta cell secreting insulin, and you have a a problem with the body not being receptive and causing a state of insulin resistance. So I'm gonna to talk to you about type one diabetes today. And I'm simply put, why does it occur? Is it increasing? How is it treated? And will there be a cure? That's a lot to cover, but I'm not going too in depth. So I borrowed slides from my colleague, Steve Gittleman, who is the head of the pediatric diabetes program here at UCSF, and he is a pediatric endocrinologist who does a lot of research in preventing the onset of type 1 diabetes in known or at-risk people. So I'm going to talk to you about how it develops. So we start with a genetic risk, and everyone who gets type 1 diabetes has an associated gene, and we've identified those genes in type 1 diabetes, whereas type 2 diabetes is a lot more complex. There's a multi -gen it's very multi-gene factorial or multifactorial genetics, whereas in type 1, we can identify the genetics a, a lot more specifically. So the general population, it's not a very rare, it's not a very common condition. Only about 1 in 300 people will get di type 1 diabetes. However, if they have a known relative with type 1 diabetes, um, the risk becomes much greater. So everyone who's diagnosed with diabetes has the gene. General population is 1 in 300. If family members are at about 15 times greater risk to develop type 1 diabetes, so then the risk becomes about 1 in 20. This is an autoimmune condition. So the, there has to be sort of immune activation, and we don't really know what that is. Speculation is viruses, 
Um, and those, that speculation comes from population studies where a certain particular virus has hit a community hard, and then many years later there's a surge in the, in, or there's a quite a, a little, ep, it's not an epidemic, but a little epidemic, if you will, of a rise in type 1 diabetes in a community that had a particular virus that they can track a few years prior. So they do think that there's these environmental insults, but that may be what activates the immune system on top of the genetics, but then not everyone goes on to have the immune response. And the immune response is what gets us into trouble. So the common event could be a virus. Um, and there's, you know, we're trying to figure out what these are. Um, but as I mentioned, there are some viral um, incidences that have caused increased uh, diagnosis of type 1 in community. So um, the immune response, if you go back to that first slide, you have the genetic risk, the immune activation, and now you have an immune response. And that means that once the immune activation has happened, the body actually is now producing an antibody to that immune process. So the immune system responds to the beta cells being attacked. It results in the development of antibodies. And these antibodies are a visible signal that the immune system's activated. But the antibody itself is not what destroys the beta cell. Okay, so hang on to that for a sec. So we're back to the main slide. You have this immune response. You've developed an antibody. Just a minute. Hold on. I'll tell you what that is later. My pump is buzzing at me. I, I forgot to mention I also have type 1 diabetes. Um, so there's immune activation. The beta cells are attacked. And the immune response is the development of an antibody. So lots of people have the risk. Some people get their immune system activated. Even fewer people have this specific immune response by de developing an antibody. Um, and then we can start to really see who's at risk for developing type 1 diabetes. So there's, that's an antibody signal. And then we get into actually being able to stage the onset of diabetes. When a person has two or more antibodies, there's almost 100% certainty that they will develop diabetes, type 1 diabetes at some point in their life, okay? So stage one, the presence of greater than two antibodies, more, two or more, the blood sugar is still normal, the beta cells are being destroyed at this point, but the remaining beta cells can maintain the body's normal blood sugar at, at normal level. So we think that up to 80% or so of these beta cells can be destroyed, and those 20% remaining become more courses and can make enough insulin for the body to survive in a symptom-free state. So no symptoms. So stage two is when we, we see the development of symptoms. So abnormal blood sugar can be measured. This has, by the way, all been studied because of uh, research. This is not happening in the general community. This is identifying siblings at risk or parents at risk, looking at their antibodies. They're coming in to have their blood taken. We're, t we're, we're letting people know, yes, you have an antibody. Yes, you have two antibodies. We need you to do these tests. I mean, this is all willingly consented sort of research. But this is not, we're not doing this in the general population. This is all within research. It's called trial net. It, it is nationwide and now even worldwide. So stage two, two or more antibodies, beta cells are being destroyed. Um, and now we're getting to the point where the beta cells, those 20, 30% beta cells remaining, cannot keep up with the body's need for insulin. And they, you, we can start to see impaired glucose tolerance, similar to what Dr. Mashrani was talking about in type 2, where it's not like frank symptoms or frank hyperglycemia, but we're starting to see the levels rise when we give them that um, big amount of sugar to drink and then test the blood sugar. They still have no symptoms at this stage. Stage 3 is what we used to be where we started. This is what, where diabetes started. Now, we, because we know about the antibodies in the immune process, we can actually stage people much earlier, help prevent them get, from getting very sick, um, and potentially intervening to try to stop the full destruction of these beta cells. So this is, like I said, what formerly known as the beginning of type 1, 
Um, it's marked by the clinical diagnosis. Dr. Masharani went through those numbers. Random blood sugar greater than 200, fasting glucose greater than 126 with symptoms, an A1 hemoglobin A1C greater than 6.5. And now this person has symptoms. So they could be urinating more, hungry, um, thirsty, losing weight, et cetera. And then stage four is now what we call longstanding diabetes. So continuing over time a, a loss of beta cell. So we used to think even as, as few as 10 years ago, we used to think that it was an absolute destruction of those beta cells and that you were completely 100% insulin dependent. Only in the last few years have we looked at long-term survivors of type 1. Jocelyn, which is a leading center in this country for diabetes, Jocelyn did a survivor study, and they looked at people with diabetes 50 years or more because they were living, many of them, healthy, um, productive lives with 50 years of a very demanding condition. And what they found is a third of those people had some beta cell function. They didn't, they were shocked. So there's a small percentage of folks that retain some beta cell function, which probably is genetic and probably helps protect them against microvascular complications. So outside of trial net, what we're working on, this is all, like I said, study. Now we're in the real world. You've got diabetes. You're out of the research. Um, we have an engineer's approach which is these closed loop systems to try to get technology to act like a pancreas. So a pancreas senses, the beta cells sense the rise in glucose, they put out insulin, and they keep your body's blood sugars normal all the time. Normal blood sugar, by the way, 70 to about 120 if you're fasting, um, 70 to about 160 if you're not fasting. So we have already in, in progress these closed loop systems where a person wears like an insulin pump that gives them insulin and they wear a device that senses their blood sugar and the two can talk to each other. So this first system has been around for about a year and a half. That's the one that was just talking to me. I'm wearing it, telling me that my blood sugar was on the rise. It's fine, it's in range, but it's telling me you're, you're alert, you're going up. And then we have had for some time beta cell replacement. It's a little more complicated. We do do whole pancreas transplants, but we don't have a huge cadaver pool in this country, so that's not a very common procedure. And we usually only do whole pancreas transplants when somebody who's had diabetes for a long time and their kidneys have been damaged and they need a kidney transplant, we as a medical system try to then get them a pancreas as well. Because if you're gonna put a kidney in, and the first person has to take drugs to suppress their immune system to keep the kidney in, then they would be very nice to do the pancreas as well. So I, I've been working in camps for, like Teresa said, 35 years now, and I, have, I know many, many people with type 1 diabetes, and I do know a handful of folks out there who've had their pancreas and kidney transplanted. They take the immune suppression drugs, but they are insulin free. Um, islet cells, those are the beta cells. They, they grow in these little clusters called islets. We can actually um, take a cadaver pancreas. We can spin it around, pull the islet cells, the beta cells out. We can transplant them back into someone like me with type 1 diabetes through the portal vein in the liver. And then they kind of grow right there in the liver. Very cool. But immune the immune system has an incredible memory. So if someone gives me beta cell transplants, put, puts those cells into my liver, my immune memory, what, what is my immune system going to do to those beta cells? It's going to kill them. Because I have autoimmune diabetes. I still have the genetics for it. My immune memory is very good. It's going to say, ooh, ooh, those are foreign. Get them out. And they're going to start destroying them again. So. I would have to, with just getting beta cells also, even though it's not a whole organ, I would also have to take immune suppression. So it's been tried and true. It works well. But unfortunately, um, you need one to two cadavers to get enough beta cells to implant in one person, and those beta cells only last a couple years. So it's not a really good solution. 
Now, the last little bullet down there, stem cell derived beta cells, is very, very exciting because just this week, actually, Teresa posted something on social media. I didn't even know it was happening right here. I hadn't even heard about it. I'm talking to the researchers. They're not telling me. My nephew in law wrote the press release. He's a scientific writer for UCSF. He didn't forward it to me. I don't think anybody realized that, like, I want to know what's happening. Just on February 1st was a press release from UCSF, from our Diabetes Research Center, on one of the most exciting things I've heard about in a very, very long time. And I'm going to try to explain it in as best lay person language as I can. Um, so stem cells are, are, any cell can be made from a stem cell. And I learned how to say it in Spanish this weekend, because I did a camp for Spanish-speaking people this weekend. It's called la célula madre, or mother cell. I like that better. It makes more sense than stem cell, or padre cell, whatever, parent cell. Um, I don't want to be uh, sexist here. So you take a stem cell, and you make it into a beta cell. Brilliant, right? They've been working on this for 20 plus years. Just in the last year, in a lab right across the courtyard, was a postdoc working under our diabetes center who said, you know, maybe we need to keep those cells together. Because in the pancreas, they gather together in islets, or what, what, what are called islands of beta cells. So she figured out a way to start the generation of the stem cell. And then once they started to differentiate, she grouped them into the cluster like they like to be. And all of a sudden, they started developing rapidly. This is huge. So we could now start to make beta cells in the laboratory. If that's the case, then we can start transplanting them into human beings, which is pretty darn cool. I still have to take immune suppression drugs for that. However, how many of you have heard CRISPR? It's the new, like the gene deletion technology where you can like mess with the actual <laughs> genetics or the DNA of something and change it. The Diabetes Research Center lead here, Dr. Hebrick, thinks that they can delete the gene that causes my immune system to attack my beta cells when they're making these new beta cells. Okay, I haven't been hopeful like this in 42 years. So this is very exciting, and it happened right here at UCSF. And I always tell people when my family's like, I want a cure, nobody's working on a cure. And I'm like, could I just walk them to the lab across the street of a scientist I've known for 25 years, a colleague of Umesh's and mine, Dr. Mike German, runs a beta cell lab. I've known Mike for 25 years. He's still in that beta cell lab trying to make this happen. There's so many scientists like him across the world trying to make this happen. But the fact that it might happen right here at UCSF is super, super exciting for me. Now. How long, these are, now what they did is they took these mother cells, they made them into beta cells, they grouped them together, they started developing, they put them in mice with diabetes. They have these genetically engineered mice, by the way, called NOD mice, non-obese diabetic mice, NOD, and they put them in and they cured their diabetes. Now, that's super hopeful, so they're working, the problem is, how long does it take to get to human subjects? <laughs> so it takes a while. But I'm really hopeful for this because there's very, very little danger in this potential procedure of taking laboratory-made beta cells and putting it into a human being. Because you're going to watch your blood sugars. You're still going to monitor what's going on. Your, the, the biggest risk is someone take, is taken off insulin, and then they get sick from not being on their insulin. So this is very exciting. All right, so then this last slide on autoimmunity is just to, to show people that depending on how old you are, your autoimmune attack is, can, is much slower if you're older, much faster if you're younger. And do you remember, Dr. Mashani showed you the 80-year-old woman with type 1 diabetes? So in adults, we have something called LADA, latent autoimmune diabetes of the adult. It really is type 1 diabetes, but it's a very slow autoimmune destruction. So what happens is they go to their doctor or their nurse practitioner, like me, um, in the community, and they have the symptoms of diabetes, but because they're 60 years old, they assume they have type 2 diabetes. 
because you can still, 10% of people with type 2 diabetes are normal body weight. So that lady, somebody assumed she was type 2, put her on metformin, which will not help if you have insulin deficiency or autoimmune diabetes. So this is a graphic to just show that if you're younger, it develops fast, and if you're older, it develops slower. So you can get type 1 at any age, it's just that it's much more common in young people. Um, so there, there is screening available. Um, not many people in this room would qualify because you have to be under 45. Uh, there's a few youngins over there. Um, but you have to be screened. You have to have a known relative with type 1. You have to be under 45 years old. Um, and then if you're under 18 and you, you are negative for antibodies, they will repeat the test every year until you're 18. Once you're over 18, if you're a first-degree relative, they stop checking you. So incidence is going up of type 1. Um, youth with type 1. Also, this is just a, s a schematic showing you that type 2 in youth is also increasing in prevalence quite a bit. The light blue is type 2, and the dark blue is type 1, and you can see from 10 to 19 years old. In some populations, um, type 2 is more common than type 1. So on the far right are um, American Indians. The um, far right to second bar is Asian Pacific Islanders. Um, and non-Hispanic black, so um, um, certain, and Hispanic is the age, certain populations, uh, the prevalence of type 2 in youth is greater than that of type 1. This is a, a, just a, a, a representation because a lot of people compare 1 to 2, and it's not really that they should be compared. It's just that in medical school and nursing school, you learn diabetes kind of all grouped together. So I put up this to kind of show in type 1, most commonly presented in children and adolescents, um, but a, only about 50% are under age 20 when they're diagnosed. So that means 50% of the di diagnoses are happening after age 20, even though it used to be called juvenile diabetes. We no longer call it that. It is um, t classified as type 1. Peak incidence is in puberty for girls, puberty for boys, and girls and boys go through puberty at different ages, so that's about um, 11 for girls, uh, a little later, 13 for boys. The, the genetics is more Northern European, so the highest rate of type 1 diabetes in the world is Norway, Sweden, and Finland, and they have incredible registries there studying. Um, it's about 1 in 350 kids. The risk for siblings is about 3 to 5%. Monozygotic or identical twins is 30%. If you follow them throughout their lifetime, it gets close to 80%. And this is where if you have the same genes, well, come on, why wouldn't you be getting... Um, the diabetes, well, it's because of this environmental trigger that needs to happen. So one twin may not have been exposed to the environmental activation of their immune system. Uh, type 1s are at great risk for ketoacidosis. That's DKA. So if they go very insulin deficient, they go into a metabolically deranged state where they make no insulin. The body floods, um, is flooded with um, counter-regulatory hormones like epinephrine and cortisol. And that just makes the body try to release more and more glucose into the system, and then they become, um, their blood becomes very, very acidotic. And that, that's how most um, people with diabetes die, is from uh, ketoacidosis. It's a pretty low mortality rate in this country, but very high in other countries. Um, and then it's an autoimmune condition. So we have lots of autoimmune conditions that go along with type 1. The most common are celiac um, and hypothyroidism but there's lots of other ones. They're just uh, more rare. And then as Dr. Mascherani went through all of those things with type, type 2 is you often have a metabolic syndrome with hypertension. Uh, you can have fatty liver, um, obesity very commonly, um, very strong family history. And um, he went through the treatments and lifestyle modification. You'll get more of that in the next few weeks um, from our nutritionists and um, pharmacists and uh, doctors talking about insulin and oral agents. And then I do want to, he talked about the UK PDS, which was the United Kingdom Prospective Study, which was done with type 2s. This study was conducted in the late 80s, and, and it finished in 93, and it is the gold standard for why we do what we do in type 1 diabetes. So when I was diagnosed 42 years ago, I was on a very rudimentary therapy. There was no glucose monitoring. And in the, in the late 70s, early 80s, glucose monitoring became available. But people still did not understand that it was the high blood sugars causing the microvascular damage. 
So they actually did an RCT, a randomized controlled clinical trial with 1,400 people across the country, and they randomized them into two groups, an intensive arm and a wait and watch and see arm. And they followed these folks for about six and a half years, and after six years, the, the results were so remarkable, they actually had to stop the trial and say, we have to now translate this into clinical um, practice. And the lower, the yellow shows the average A1C in the intensive treatment was maintained around a seven, 7.1%, 7 now that you know what A1C is. And then in the conventional, uh, kind of the watch and wait usual care arm, it, it was maintained around 9%. And over a six and a half year period of the study, retinopathy was reduced by up to 76% in the two groups. N neuropathy was reduced by 60% between the two groups. Nephropathy was reduced by over 50%. So they knew without a shadow of a doubt that controlling the glu glucoses were what reduced complications. Great news, this is 93. Now we've been doing this for 25 years. And we still haven't been able to get these A1Cs where we want them because it's a hugely, hugely complicated um, condition to manage. And there's a lot of lifestyle um, and behavioral and social elements as well that play into it. Uh, this is an A1C chart. So you can see the study group was maintaining a glucose average about 150. And the non-intervening group was about 212. So that difference of glycemia between a 115 and 212 greatly protected the folks in the intensive or study group arm. And this is the reality. So this is a, a data point. Uh, there's over 60,000 data points here, 60,000 hemoglobin A1Cs grouped by age. And you can see our kids aren't doing well at all. And I'm a pediatric practitioner, so I know all about that. And uh, particularly our uh, middle to late adolescents have the highest A1C of all, but even it takes to be about 25, 30 years old before we're getting anywhere near target A1C for the general population. So it's really hard when you need insulin to be completely replaced. It's really hard to get to that target A1C. So the treatment is to get the lowest A1C possible without making someone hypoglycemic on a regular basis because hypoglycemia can be dangerous. Um, they have to monitor their glucose um, either by finger stick, still happening a lot, or by the newer ways, which is um, an inserted sensor that the patient learns to insert and change out every 7 to 14 days. That's called CGM, continuous glucose monitoring. There's some new, uh, a new product on the market that's um, not continuous, but you can um, put the sensor in and just kind of ask for when you want the information by wanding the sensor. Um, so that's called a FGM. They call it like a flash glucose monitoring. Is that what it, yeah, FGM. And that's the only product out there right now is the Libre. And it's gaining a lot of popularity right now. I don't own stock. I have no disclosures. Um, but it is an amazing product. So we put all of our folks with type 1 diabetes on physiologic regimens whenever possible, including um, using the pump. Um, in all ages. So even two-year-olds, I started my first two-year-old on a pump in 1998, right across the street at the clinic. We have a lot of toddlers on pumps um, because it delivers insulin like your bodies deliver insulin. You eat, you, you put out insulin. A toddler eats, the parent doses the insulin through the, you know, this pager-sized device that is worn. Um, in toddlers, they sew these cute little backpacks onto them so they're not playing with them. There's all kinds of ways to get them to wear it and not complain. Um, they learn to carb count. You'll learn about that when Sherry Schaefer comes to talk to you. But sugar is OK for folks within reason. For all of us, should be within reason. But it really is OK for um, my kids, my kiddos to eat sugar. They just have to learn to dose, count the carbohydrates in the sugar, and dose correctly for the carbohydrates. All carbohydrates convert to sugar. Believe it or not, white potatoes convert faster than table sugar in your blood. So this whole idea that we should avoid sugar was a really just archaic uh, thing that's been debunked for about 20 years now. Um, we do encourage exercise, as I would for any person, any pediatric patient of mine, whether they have diabetes or not, I encourage exercise. And sleep needs to be added in there. There's a lot, a lot of sleep studies around lack of sleep, poor sleep, affecting our insulin sensitivity. So sleep is really important in our health. 
And then developmentally really targeting um, where you are, whether you're two, 15, 18, 25, or 50 makes a big difference in how we approach and individualize your care. Here's targets for youth for A1C, for adults, depending on your organization. I follow an ADA, which is under seven. It's really, really hard for adults with type one to get below 6.5. It's really, really hard for them to get to, to seven. You showed, I showed you the data points with 60,000 data points. They're not slacking out there. They're just, it's a really hard thing to do. Um, and then the elderly are individualized targets and can be much, much higher. So some elderly can have high targets as high as nine, depending on cognition, fall risk, all kinds of things. This is just a schematic of how we want to deliver insulin. The red shows what your pancreases do. And then um, the, the ideal treatment is to either wear a pump and dose based on meals and blood sugar, or to use a basal insulin and then dose at every meal time. And Dr. Kim's gonna go a whole hour on insulin, so you'll get insulin. But I want to show you, like, we're trying to strive to do what the pancreas does, and we're just not very good at it. There are a thousand ways you can give, ins give insulin. So this shows you basal plus meal time. This shows you three times a day regular insulin, or three times a day rapid acting insulin, or premixes. There's all kinds of ways to give insulin. It's just not, when you give insulin through the fat, it acts very different than when your insulin is delivered right into your bloodstreams. So it's really, that difference makes it very, very hard. This is the system I was talking to you about, the hybrid closed loop system. Dr. Neinstein's gonna talk about technology in the fifth week, I think, and he'll go through pump therapy. But this is what I currently wear. I wear a pump. That's not me, by the way. I did this lecture today and I said, I really should take a picture of my belly so it looks real. <laughs> but then I was like, maybe not. Uh, thank you, oh gosh, thank you. <laughs> oh, is that her? <laughs> Woo! Um, so this is a catheter that's put into the fat and it's self-inserted every three days. And then the tubing goes to the pump and the pump has only one kind of insulin that's delivered continuously. And then this is a sensor. I wear mine on the back of my arm. Um, and it sends the glucose readings to the pump every five minutes. So this is the first step in closing the loop that the pump sees the blood sugar and then can make some independent from me decisions. <laughs> and that's a big step. This is only a year and a half old, this closed loop process. And then I just wanted to end with kind of a nursing framework. Um, Ideal, I'm a specialist in pediatric diabetes, but about 90% of what I do is not adjust insulin, is not um, tell people like that they should exercise and eat and all that. I really deal with a family system that is key in helping everyone, regardless of the age, with type 1 diabetes or type 2 diabetes. The family system is very important. So I, I end, I'm ending with two slides about family factors that are protective and family factors that can cause risk. So, um, and this is uh, Dr. Fisher, he's another one of our professor emeritus. He's a wonderful uh, psychologist here. He'll be talking to you the last week of class. You can tell him I quoted one of his research studies in the beginning. Um, but they looked at family, families and they could sort of thematically through qualitative research um, look at factors or traits in families that, that led to better outcomes. And family emotional closeness or connectedness, uh, parental coping skills, mutually supportive relationships, clear family organization and decision making and direct communication about diabetes was highly protective for these um, families. And this was not children, this was dealing with type one in a family system. And family factors, um, um, risk factors in chronic illness were families that were high, had high conflict or criticism, uh, trauma related to disease, so like a kid who got really, really sick, almost died at diagnosis, something like that. Um, external family stressors, we know those, right? Poverty, access to health care, all of those things make it really, really hard to manage a chronic condition. Family isolation. So last weekend, I, I ran a camp for 30 families who are monolingual Spanish speakers and their kids have type 1 diabetes. One of the, one of the most rewarding things I've done in all my career is help start that camp. Because these families are highly isolated. They, 
they, they can't even sometimes talk to the school nurse. They can't go to a regular program because they don't speak the language. It's not being translated. We put them in a group together. They get the peer support. They're exchanging numbers at the end. We had a dad's group towards the end of camp, and the dads were all exchanging numbers. Just wonderful. Um, disruption of developmental tasks by the disease this happens a lot in pediatrics. So 14-year-olds have to act older than they are and do self-care in schools. Seven-year-olds have, have to learn how to how to poke their fingers. This is really disruptive to a developmental um, process for a child. And then family rigidity and perfectionism is also something that is a, is a risk factor when you're dealing with chronic illness. So with that, I will take questions. The question is, I showed a slide that type one is increasing, and um, why would that be? relative to type two, which you can kind of understand environmentally, people are getting, there's more and more obesity, which, yes. So there's a number of theories as to why type one might be increasing, and there's so many research studies looking at protective factors, like does breastfeeding protect from the development of type one diabetes? And unfortunately, the big answer out is that it, it seems to be a neutral effect. We, for years we thought, oh yeah, you, you know, Breastfeeding has a lot of other protective effects, but it doesn't look like breastfeeding actually protects your infant from developing type 1 diabetes. But I'll give you one that I think is, is likely, and the one that Dr. Gittleman always gives when he gives his talk, is a hy hygiene hypothesis. Hygiene hypothesis. And that is the, the fact that we're becoming um, uh, less exposed to dirt, less exposed to our immune systems. We wash our hands with antimicrobial soap. We don't play in the dirt as much as we used to. We are less likely to have grown up on a farm than we used to. And so our immune systems may be getting less um, uh, smart, if you will, because we aren't kind of exposing it to um, more of the, the environmental dirt and allergens that maybe help us build uh, um, immunity against some of these things. So that's one hypothesis, um, but there's many, many, many being looked at. Vitamin D, like are we, get, you know, are we getting enough vitamin D in our diets? There's all kinds of studies that you can look into in terms of how, what they're trying to track and see if this was contributory to the rising uh, in, uh, prevalence of type one. Absolutely. So the question is, when you see the antibodies appearing, have people tried to modulate the immune system? Absolutely. Again, Dr. Gittleman, my colleague, and I, I, these were only 10 of his 40 slides. Believe me, I could not deliver the rest of the slides. I had to tell you about type 1 diabetes, but there is a ton of work being done at disrupting the process from the formation of that first or second antibody to the destruction of the beta cell. There are drugs being used in other immune conditions that are being found beneficial. Um, Dr. Gittleman's worked on a number of different studies here um, in terms of immune disruptors um, targeting the, the T4 cells. So it, yes, a lot. And that's why we try to find people at risk, not only to prevent ketoacidosis, but to get them enrolled in studies because we have a long list of studies across the nation that people could be eligible for. So the question is, why do the teenagers have such a higher A1C? Um, it's a highly complex question, but I have my pat answer, because <laughs> I, I teach this all the time. So in puberty, there is an enormous surge in the sex hormones, estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, um, and there's also enormous increase in growth hormone because you are in one of your biggest growth spurts of your life. All of those hormones cause insulin resistance. So they antagonize the action of the insulin the kids are injecting. So the way I tell my parents this so they understand it's not Susie's fault, essentially, is I can have a patient my exact same size and weight. I take 30 units a day. Susie has type 1 diabetes, and she may need 90 units a day. Because of the internal insulin resistance that's happening inside her body. So the parents often immediately go to, um, what did you eat? What are you doing? Blah, 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 blah. Okay, so that's one element, is there's a very large increase in the needs of insulin during puberty. And they don't just happen like in stages. We only see kids every three months. It's happening between those visits. 
So are you watching the blood sugars? Are you calling in for the insulin adjustments? Are you watching your child give all their insulin? That's another big one. So there's a lot of social factors as well. Teenagers miss more insulin than any other group. So they don't have diabetes on the front burner of the stove. Like we say, you know, it's, it's kind of on the back burner, that expression. Well, I try to tell my families is like for a teenager, they have school on the burner and they have sports on the burner and they have romance and peer life on the burner and something over here. Diabetes isn't even on the stove. It's in the oven. <laughs> it's not even registering. They want to be kids first. And so the parent has to be super involved in these tasks. And I will tell you, the smartest two-parent, high-functioning families still have trouble. <laughs> because You can be as educated as you want, but trying to get a teen to stay on a regimen like as difficult as this is very, very hard. Uh-huh. It's even going up more. And why is that happening? Because I'm giving a lecture and I have no control over the natural occurring stress hormones in my body. <laughs> Unless I were a monk meditating an hour to two hours a day, I can't control the fact that I'm having fun here. This is lovely. I'm enjoying this. My body still is registering this as a stress. So I, and also just eight, so that's part of it, but I gave insulin for it, but yeah. So those are the kinds of things that you just can't possibly control. And it's the same in type two. Type two have internal stressors too that raise blood sugar despite eating well, exercising. Um, and some of the biggest stressors are grief, losing a loved one, those kind of things. Internally, there's a, a, a very strong reaction um, in grief or illness or just enjoying myself giving a lecture. Yes, can you have both? That's such a great question. Yes, you can. It's a weird thing. So you can have a family history of type 2 diabetes. You can get type 1. You have the antibodies, the genes. You get type 1. And then you take insulin. But there's a very potent family history of type 2. You can become resistant to the insulin you're injecting, just like you can become insulin resistant to the insulin that your body produces. So you can have this sort of combination diabetes, absolutely. We see it in our kids who come from families with strong histories of type two. They have type one, we've measured the antibodies, we treat them with insulin, but then they're like very resistant to their insulin. We don't really call it anything different, but it's kind of like a combination of both. All right, thank you so much. I'm so happy with how many folks turned out today. Thank you for coming.